I am here again because I have the privilege to introduce a very special uh, service to you today. Now, we have what we call a three in seven today, y'all. Three times the word, three times the gifting. We have three of our amazing Dream Team members who are here to share a fire word with us today. As we continue our series on Colossians, we are in chapter two. And I don't know, how many of you liked last week's message? Pastor Terrence did an amazing job. And these three communicators, they're amazing communicators of the word. And we want to make sure that we give honor where honor is due because we know that a loud church is... Okay, we're going to try this. I like this side. A loud church is a what? A live church. So when I introduce them and when they come up, we want you to go crazy in welcoming them to the stage. We want you to encourage them. Let's go ahead and practice. What you going to do when they come out on stage? That's right. That's right. Even more than you would do on a regular weekend. So you guys ready for the word? Are you ready for the word? Channeling our pastor. I would love to welcome to stage Gigi, who is on our worship team. She has led our daughter's groups. Join me in welcoming Jazz, who's also on our worship team. They actually co led a group together, an amazing daughter's group. Where are the daughters at? That's right. And finally, welcome Kevin to the stage. Kevin is our resident firefighter. We ain't got no fires here in the name of Jesus. He is on our safety team, and he has led one of our amazing courses. Is Jesus really that good? You guys give it up for our speakers today. I'm going to invite Kevin on up. You guys give it up for Kevin as he kicks us off this morning. Come on, you can do better than that. All right, all right. That was quick, that was quick. Um, what's up, History Makers Church? All right, I first would like to thank uh, Pastor Terrence and Pastor Emma for allowing us this opportunity to share the word because um, it's a blessing, actually. Uh, so let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. And it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it, with thanksgiving. So I want to break these two verses down. First it says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Before you can do anything in your Christian life, you have to understand how you received Christ Jesus the Lord. And you received him by hearing the message of his salvation. And just in case you forgot the message, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 4. It says, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now what does this mean? Jesus lived his earthly life on our behalf. That means he died, and then he took our sins to the grave, and then he was resurrected only to prove that he took all of our sins and he fully paid for them. So his resurrection has given us peace with God, which means God is now forever on our side. And why is that? Because we have exchanged identities with Jesus. By faith, Jesus temporarily became like us on the cross so that by faith we can permanently become like him in his resurrection. And because of his resurrection, I want y'all to hear these truths. Jesus is your health when you are facing sickness. He is your wisdom when you lack understanding. He is your provision when you are in need. He is your right standing with God when you see your failures. 
and all of his blessings are targeted towards you. You have to hear this and take this gift of the forgiveness of sins. That's how you receive Jesus. I know everybody feels familiar with hearing that Jesus died for all of their sins. But the question I have is, do you actually believe it? Because if you don't remember it or believe it on a daily basis, and I specify a daily basis, the fruit that God wants to produce through you will be very limited. The next part of verse 6 says, so walk in him. The same way you receive Jesus is the same way you walk in him, by faith. Faith in what? The message. The message about who? Jesus. Walking refers to how we live our new life. Our walk is based on our faith in our new identity in Jesus. Your walk is determined by what you believe, not by what you do. So if our walk is determined by what we believe, what can we do to make sure that we believe our new identity? Verse 7 has the answer. It says to be rooted and built up in him. To be rooted means we have to be aware of and fix in the knowledge that he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through what? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. To be rooted means to stand firm in the truth that you now have the forgiveness of sins and that you are now in the kingdom of Jesus. You're not trying to be in the kingdom of Jesus. You are already in it. And you have to be strengthened by that truth. The next part of verse 7 says this, and built up in him. You have to keep encouraging yourself that the perfect Jesus has now made you perfect, that he loves you so much that he ensured that he is able to bless you with every blessing with no reason not to bless you. And the next part says this, and established in the faith. You have to be firm in the fact that you now have the same identity as Jesus. What's true about Jesus is true about you right now. And if God gave us Jesus, his most precious gift, how will he not also freely give us all things? You have to already know that you're complete in him. That's how you walk in him. The walking is in your mind and in your conscience, what you think, what you believe. And the next part, it says, as you have been taught, now, the preachers and the teachers are the ones responsible for you knowing this message. And the message should be built on the same message that Paul preached. Why? Because his message is the words of the risen Jesus and not just the words of Jesus before he died and was resurrected. There's a big difference. And the next part says, abounding in it with thanksgiving. When you start to understand and grasp what Jesus has actually accomplished for you in the gospel, you will overflow with thankfulness and appreciation because you will begin to see how good God is. God really did save you so perfectly that you have become as holy as he is and as righteous as he is. He knows that the more you believe in what he did, the more your behavior will uh, conform to who you actually are. You will begin to see and experience how wonderful it is to have an inseparable relationship with God. You will see how much of a miracle it is for God to change you, knowing that within yourself, you offer God nothing good. So I'm speaking to the people who struggle like I did. Some of you are struggling with a sinful habit, uh, something that you've been desperately trying to stop for a long time. And you want to know why it's probably been so hard for you to stop. It's not because you don't love God. It's not because you don't care about God. It's because you're not yet convinced that you have the same identity as Jesus. Instead, you are trying to be like Jesus. He didn't save us for us to try to be like him. He saved us so that he can make us like him. And if you have received his life, you are already like him. The sin is made stronger every time you try. So every day, remind yourself that you have the same identity as Jesus. Every time you fail, remind yourself even more that you have the same identity as Jesus. And then one day, you will look up and realize that you are now walking in him and that sinful habit has fallen away. So I want y'all to say this with me. I have the forgiveness of sins. That's crucial to hear when you've realized you've just sinned. I want you to say, the Lord is with me everywhere I go. That's crucial to hear when you are walking through a difficult time in your life. And lastly, I want you to say this. 
When God sees me, he sees the glory of Jesus. That's crucial to hear when you start to see more of your imperfections. The gospel is about his, his goodness, not ours. We were only able to offer him our sinfulness continually. But in return, he offered us his life eternally. God bless. Oh, can y'all give it up for Kevin? So good. Colossians 2, verse 8 through 10, it reads like this. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Church, this morning I like to title this message, Fullness Lives. In this passage, we see Paul, he's talking to the church of Colossae. And in verse 8, he's like, see to it that no one takes you captive. And I like to think of this word captive because it makes me think of like captivity or like a prisoner. Um, it's it just a, a clear picture of confinement, someone who's just not free. And Paul was warning this church to be aware of the falsehoods, of the empty lies that pass off as truth. And for traditions that don't look like Jesus. He says, see to it, make it your job, make it your business to not be held by these lies. My entire life, I've known of this Jesus. When I turned 12, I made the decision to give my life to Christ. And I'm 32 today, so 20 years ago. And I want to talk about the age, because youth, I'm coming back to you. I like to talk about the age because youth, what's so important is that every Sunday as you worship here, every Sunday after, sur Sunday, after Sunday, what it does is it leaves a bookmark in your life. So when you find yourself in a cycle that feels like it's never ending, you can come back to this moment. From the age of 12 up until now, I've seen God do some really incredible things. I've seen some of my friends' wombs being healed. I've seen my sister's cancer cells be completely removed from her body. Literally, the doctor said, what was there before is not there now. And, and I've also seen in my family, my dad, who at some point got caught up in alcohol, and for 20 years, he was bound by it. But I can say today that he's free. And God can do it for you if that is something that you're struggling with. If he can do it for my dad and my family, he can do it for you today. However, there's always a but, right? My own captivity was believing that God could do it for everyone else, but he wouldn't do it for me. I used to think that I'll never find love. I won't ever be able to come out of this debt that I feel like it's been holding me down, like I'm going to be a slave to my finances forever. So I want to ask you, are you captive? What are some things that have been holding you down? Maybe you fully believe that you would be stuck in a cycle over and over, that the generational curse over your family will continue to live with you and your children. Maybe you're like me and you just said, man, it's just not in the books for me. The thing with captivity though, is that some people aren't even aware that they're captive. Paul is warning us of these spiritual forces and these empty philosophies. And again, the issue with captivity is that most aren't even aware because oftentimes captivity looks comfortable. It looks familiar. Captivity um, will say that the world, the traditions, and the cultures of this world are the ones who define you, are the ones who say that this is you. And somehow we begin to believe it so much so that we've become accustomed to hearing the chains that are actually bound to us. It's almost like a familiar sound. But allow me to turn your attention to the next verses. 
In verse 9, it says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And as we were preparing, I realized that I didn't necessarily really know what the word fullness meant. I sing about the fullness of God, but what does it actually mean? In verse 9, he says that, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And that's a bunch of words that sound a little bit confusing. But what really Paul is saying is that in Christ, in Christ, the fullness lives. So remember last week when Pastor Terrence was up here, he was throwing that water all over his body. But something shifted when he drank the water because now it's in him. You see, what we saw is that fullness lives in us. Jesus died for us as human, but he rose again, which means he continues to live, meaning that the fullness of God lives forever. It's not something that comes and goes. It's not temporary. It is Jesus that is the fullness of God. And because Jesus Christ did it, we're also brought alongside with him to be participants of his fullness. Earlier, I mentioned that word captive because confinement, like we're chained down. It makes me think of those movies where people uh, were kidnapped and there has to be, like in order to be returned, there must be a, a ransom paid. And just like that, we may be found in our respective captivities, but Jesus came in and he said, I paid the ransom for you. I paid it all for you. You see, there's an exchange like Kevin was saying. We are no longer captive, but now we're complete. Jesus is bringing us out of lack and into fullness. He's bringing us out of confusion and into certainty. You may have been lost, but now you're free found. He is the head over every power and authority. So when it looks like what Paul was warning us about, we can remember that we have access to experience the fullness of God in Jesus Christ. Come on, give it up for jazz. <laughs> so good, so good. Good morning, church. So we are going to jump into Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And if I can tell you, I mean, highlight this, bookmark this verse, because there's times like we have to just be reminded and we have to go back. And it says, and you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. Having forgiven all trespasses, having wiped out all handwriting of the requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I want to speak of this thought of my debt was paid. See, before we have new life in Jesus, we are dead in our trespasses. See, a trespass is a specific kind of sin. It's overstepping a boundary. You know, like when y'all cross over that boundary of your neighbor's yard and steal their mangoes? I'm not looking at Joel, guys. I am not looking at Joel. <laughs> okay, we are dead because we overstep God's boundary in sin and rebellion. But it says he has made us alive together with him. You see, we can't make ourselves alive. But God can make us alive together with Jesus. We can never be made alive apart from Jesus. And then it says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us. You see, the handwriting of requirement has in mind a list of our crimes, our moral debt before God. What might that be for you? Maybe it's lying. Maybe it was an abortion. Maybe it was infidelity. Maybe it was something you did last night. What is that for you? You see, it's a debt that no imperfect person can completely pay. But it can be taken out of the way by payment from a perfect man, Jesus Christ. 
This means that the document that once condemned us is now taken out of the way, having been nailed to the cross. See, Jesus not only paid for that writing that was against us, he also took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. He did everything possible to make certain that the handwriting of requirements that was against us could no longer accuse us. You see, I love how Paul wasn't just writing to the church to remind them, but he was living in this truth. Can you imagine if Paul, who persecuted Christians, and I'm not talking about like, oh, he used to make fun of them or talk about them. He violently persecuted them. He was a part of them being put in prison, beaten, and sentenced to death. But what if Paul would have let the guilt and shame of his past prevent him from fulfilling what God had called him to do. He started more than a dozen churches and is considered the author of 13 books of the Bible. See, we need to be reminded that Christ not only nailed our sin to the cross, but he wiped it out. For those of you that don't know, I am a PK, and that's a pastor's kid for those who don't know. Are there any other pastor's kids in, in here? Okay. <laughs> So I was basically, I was born in church. My dad started pastoring at the age of 20 years old while he was still in Bible college. So I grew up in church. I was always hearing the word of God. I knew the word. I had the best parents. Like my parents, I'm not going to say had because they still are. I have the best parents. Um, and I could not complain. But at the age of 16, 17 years old, I had lost my way. Um, we had moved from New York to Florida, and it was a huge change in my life. I felt like it was a culture shock. I was angry. I would say every day, when I turn 18, I'm moving back to New York. Like, I was mad, guys. Um, and, and it was a lot. So here I am at the age of 16 and 17. I kind of started hanging around with the wrong crowd. And I found myself in a relationship with a much older man. Now, there is something called grooming but I'm not gonna really go into that right now. I'm just gonna focus on me. So here I am in this relationship I have no business being in. And of course, this is behind my parents' back. But how many of you know that what is hidden always comes to the light? And it says it in Luke 12, 2, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So my parents find out, and when I tell you, I will never forget the pain in their eyes and the hurt of finding this out. Now, of course, there was also anger, as any parent would be, um, but it was hard. It was such a hard time. So thank the good Lord, this relationship ends. And through all of that, my parents were there for me. They never turned their back on me. They never judged me. They showed me love, just as God does with us. They continued to pray for me. And although, you know, they were there and, and they were there for me, they didn't turn their back on me. I was struggling. For a long time, I struggled with guilt of what I put them through. I struggled, I struggled with the shame of having given myself to somebody that I should have never given myself to. I felt like I wasn't good enough to sing. I wasn't good enough to lead worship. Like, I just felt like, who are you? Like, you did this, you did that. Like, I felt like it was just constantly in my mind of what I had did. And one day, I will never forget, my dad said these words to me. He said, Gigi, Satan, hates you. And those words changed my life. Again, I grew up in church. I knew Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. In John 10, 10, it says, a thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that I may give you life and have it to the full. But it was those words, Gigi, Satan hates you, that pierced my heart. And that's when I took a stand and I said, you know what? No more shame, no more guilt. He paid it all. He took my guilt, he took my shame, he nailed it to the cross, he wiped it out. I have been justified, just as if I've never sinned. I had to remind myself, I have been justified. I had to remember the word. Romans 8, 1 through 3, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, I was no longer going to allow the enemy to stop me from fulfilling the purpose that God had in my life. I knew I was called for a purpose and to reach many. I had to just step in it and walk confidently knowing that Christ paid it all. My debt was paid. And in Colossians 2.15, it says, Having disarmed principalities and power, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. And I love that part because I can picture Jesus like, ha, y'all thought you won? He triumphed, and because he triumphed, I have triumphed. I had to remind myself who I am in Jesus. I am redeemed, I am forgiven, I am chosen, and I will live from that place of grace. So church, I wanna remind you this morning, you are forgiven, you are chosen, and you can also live from that place of grace. See, my debt was paid, your debt was paid, and how was it paid? It was paid in full. Come on, you guys can do better than that. You guys can do better than that. Incredible job, guys. And, you know, I am, I'm like sitting there, I'm like, and when Kevin started, I'm like, you go, Kevin, you go. And the Jazz came out, I'm like, oh, you go, Jazz. And then Gigi came out. Let me tell you, I'm really, really good. You guys can have your seats, you know. Uh, as I was listening and I was taking notes, you know, you guys can see my notes here. It's all in red and everything that I'm writing, 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 writing. There's some takeaways, Kevin, that I got out of your word. He said this, that Jesus didn't save you for you, to be, for you to try to be like him. Jesus saved you so that he can make you like him. I don't know who needs to hear that today. As you ponder that, Jazz, what I took out, I, I took something out of your message. I just took a word out. It says, for many of us, captivity doesn't like captivity. We're captives and we think it's okay in some senses. In some senses, we know that we are captive because we feel it. In other senses, like, we know that we are living contrary to what God wants us to live. And we know that, and we know that we're in captivity, but sometimes we like that captivity. But right now you feel like, yeah. And you recognize that what you thought brought you joy is actually killing you. And you said this, Jazz, you said that Jesus took captivity captive because the fullness of God lives in us. And Gigi. Like Gigi tied it all together. She said, Jesus nailed our sins to the cross and he wiped it out. And that your parents showed you love and showed what real love looks like. And in so demonstrated Jesus' love for us. And Gigi's parents looked at her just like how Jesus looked at every one of us as justified, which literally means just as if I never sinned. Just as if I never messed up. <laughs> and you said something, Gigi, that, that really hit me. You said what your father told you, Satan hates you. I want that to sink in for a moment. That whenever you're doing something that's contrary to what the spirit that lives inside of you, 
it's coming. It's being influenced by somebody who hates you. What may feel like fun is coming from somebody who hates you. Three words. Captivity, fullness, victory. Captivity. We were all once held captive, but through the fullness of Christ, we have the victory. You know, our enemy, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The passage was read earlier, John 10.10. 10. He, does, he does it in three ways. He's a deceiver. And the first thing that he does is that he convinces us, convinces you and me, go ahead. It's okay. It's fun. It's on Netflix. They're having a great old time. And he like speaks into our minds and he says, go and do it. Go and do it. So he deceives. And the moment that you do it, he switches from deceiver to accuser. And he turns the table on you. And the reason why he does that is because he hates you. And he hates me. And he accuses you and says, you ain't no Christian. You ain't no follower of God. How could a follower of God, how could a follower of Jesus do? And he starts to accuse you of all the things that he himself convinced you to do. He doesn't play fair because he hates you. And the next thing that he tries to do is after he deceives you and he accuses you, the next thing he tries to be is the executioner. But I want to tell you this morning that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. He literally, he can, he can deceive, he can accuse, but he cannot be in judgment of you. He cannot be your executioner because there is therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. When Jesus looks at you, he sees you as, as free, he sees you as whole, he sees you as complete, he sees the fullness of himself in you. And you go to Jesus and say, God, you know, I feel bad. I feel guilty about this, this thing that I did. I cheated on. Remember? And Jesus is like, no. I don't remember. I don't know what you're talking about. He said, but. He's like, you were once held captive. But by the fullness of myself, you have the victory. Captivity, fullness, victory. Captivity, fullness, victory. Captivity, the fullness of Christ. Victory. In a moment, our worship team is going gonna, is gonna to close us out. But I want to speak to somebody this morning. And you know who you are. you're struggling with shame you're struggling with guilt you're struggling, you're struggling with feeling condemned and the enemy who hates you has got your mind spinning you're struggling with unbelief Kevin what did you say you said something about faith here that said we walk by faith, not by what we do. And so you believe in some things about yourself that God says it's not, that's not the case. That's not true. That's deception. So I'm going to ask everybody to kind of, kind of close their eyes to respect the person around them. That right now, if you are struggling, and nobody's looking except me, and Jesus, 
that if you're struggling with shame, if you're struggling with guilt, if you're struggling with fear, if you're struggling with believing something that God says that is not true about you, I want to raise your hand and I would like to pray for you. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Yes, over there. I see those hands in the back. I see those hands there. I see those hands. I see. Yeah, keep your hands up so I can recognize you. I see you. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. And I'll pray for you in a second. But there's some people right now who's like, yeah, I'm feeling condemned and I don't feel the fullness of God. And maybe it's because you have never accepted that free gift of salvation. And God is saying to you right now that today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day when no more guilt, no more shame, no more fear, no more condemnation. It stops right here. And if you want that to be your story where you can live in peace, if you just raise your hand, I want to pray for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Come on, let's give the Lord Jesus that clap off. Let me just pray for you right now. Father, I pray, Lord, that the words through these great communicators mouth that your words that you spoke through them Lord will permeate the minds the heart the soul of each and every person here Lord who raised their hands and even those who were too shamed and afraid to raise their hands God I pray that the truth of your word the truth of you living inside of them right now will start to come alive. Will start to come alive and will start to bubble up and says, I am the righteousness of Christ. I am redeemed. I am called. I am who you say I am. Lord, I pray that those words will really be their story. Lord, that we will hear testimonies that today on the day before Memorial Day on May 28, 20. 24 the chains were broken and captivity was turned around and made captive God right now I just also want to pray for those who want to receive the gift of your salvation the permanent gift of your salvation which is the completed work of Christ that when you went to the cross you said Tom John, Susan, whoever your name is, feeling right, right here that he says, I took your sin, what you did yesterday. I took your sin, what you're doing right now. Right now, the thoughts that went through your mind prior to coming to church. And I'm taking away anything that you could ever do tomorrow. And it's canceled. So Lord, with this prayer, I'm going to ask everyone to say it, just to be in support of everyone who raised their hands to say this prayer. Let's say it with me. Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for, for you letting me get in this gift of salvation. Lord Jesus, I turn around and I just face you only. I thank you for your gift of your Holy Spirit that is now living inside of me. I thank you for freedom. I thank you for peace. I thank you for joy. And I thank you for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are celebrating with you. And we want to walk this journey together. And if you prayed that prayer or you want to know more about Jesus, follow the prompts that are on the screen right now. Our vision is God's vision for you. And that's to see you live a better story, holy, healthy, happy, and bringing heaven to earth. And if you've been impacted by what you hear, partner with us. Yeah, together we can make both an epic and an eternal difference. The giving options are coming up on the screen to share the love and see people meet Jesus and live that better story.
Hey, and if you're in the South Florida area, we would love to see you in person. Check out the description below for times and places where we can meet and we'd love to see you soon. Yes, where friends become family at History Makers Church.